and the calculation of those tabulations on your cost of production formulation sheets. It took the board a very short time with no major adjustment at all between the commodities. It is a duty of the board as we move toward contracts as stated in the membership agreement to review contracts for the purpose of keeping balance between commodities. And also in reviewing these figures and, uh, and looking at them with parity figures, we found out that the farmers also know what it costs when we got through taking their, their tabulations and putting them together. Although it is a slight increase in several cases over parity, but to the old parity formulation, I'm sure it wouldn't have been. But even now, it's very close. This is a historic night because out of here, we leave this convention with a goal to talk about to all the farmers in this country. But more important, we leave this convention not just with a goal, but with a nationwide structure with delivery capabilities to make the major buyers the four or five in every commodity that are nationwide compete for our production when we unite it nationwide and as we build that production toward the 30 percent. Operation 30, the clincher. And as we move toward those goals, we have the backup systems, the nationwide structure, and the delivery system to bring about orderly marketing and collective bargaining into a position of reality. These figures will be empty figures unless we make up our minds that we back them up with determination, dedication, and unity of purpose. The price goals that you have determined and are recommended by the Board of Directors is in dairy, and this will include, of course, normal transportation differentials in various commodities from the places that they normally are considered base prices. Dairy, bottling milk, $12.75 per hundredweight. <laughs> Manufacturing milk, $11.80 per hundredweight. Corn, $3.20 a bushel. Hard red winter wheat, $4.95 a bushel. Soybeans, $7.55 per bushel. Fat cattle, 1,000 pound choice steer basis, $65.25 per hundredweight. Feeders, 500 pound choice steers, $69.50 per hundredweight. 69 dollars and 50 cents per hundredweight. Hogs, one to threes, 53 dollars and 50 cents per hundredweight. Lambs, 59 dollars and five cents per hundredweight. Upland cotton, 79 cents per pound. Edible beans, $24.50 per hundredweight. Other feed grains will, of course, be in normal feeding relationship to corn, and other wheat prices will be in normal relationship to hard red winter. 
those, and we can give you those as the departments can give you the normal relationship between those when you ask for them by the various commodities. It was impossible to figure all of them and to break them down. Those are the price goals that have been approved by the National Board of Directors. And you know there's one thing about it? When you look at those prices, it isn't anything farmers haven't already received that's just been taken away from us, hasn't it? You look at those prices, and that's what you find. This is a preliminary, of course, to the completion of Operation 30, the clincher. The clincher means the final reaching of all the goals we've sought to reach based on the cost of production plus a reasonable profit. It means that this is a culmination of all the efforts put in up to now with clear goals to achieve with the plans to achieve those by increasing our volume, improving our bargaining position, very rapidly coming come Monday morning. Not waiting till after Christmas and New Year's, and that's up to you, of course. But when we look at it, what do we have to talk to the non-members about or the non-participating NFO members? Number one, we are the only organization in American agriculture that's nationwide that has a system of collective bargaining and a delivery system to back it up that can make the large major companies compete nationwide. Nobody else has that. We have a structural plan of a commodity Minuteman system that we'll discuss more tomorrow that could make it possible with a minimum effort on the part of a few people in a thousand green counties, for example, to put together one billion bushel of grain in this country in the period of the next two weeks, if we go home and decide to do it. And there wouldn't be a major grain company in this country that would not have to come to the NFO to get part of their supply and that's a part of pricing, and that's a part of bargaining, and that's a position we can do in hogs, milk, right on down the line, cattle, you name it. That's what we can do. And the next point, it's the beginning of a courageous plan, a courageous effort, and a determination that we understand that in Operation 30, putting together 30 percent of the nation's production by various commodities, to go through the NFO nationwide collection dispatch and delivery system, that in doing that, we will then have 10 county meetings by various commodities, not larger than 10 counties, in which we will then sit down for the final legal record of establishing the cost of production plus a reasonable profit. And that will be coordinated by telephonic communication as we vote on our prices and raise our hands in our meetings in our areas, knowing that it's being done in every other corner of the nation and that then we announce those prices, and if we don't get them, it means 
a holding action, an all-out holding action. And I say it's time for us to go out of this convention with pride. I, for one, am tired of others staying, staying behind the curtains and picking at us without them getting out to give farmers the leadership and the courage to back up that leadership and the opportunity to fight for fairness and justice and the respect of the American farmer and the American public and everybody else in this nation. I'm tired of any of us apologizing in any way for the unmatched record of the NFO that never before has there been a collective bargaining program for American agriculture. Never has there been a nationwide coordinated structure. And that's what we have in the large companies, the ability and the capability to put together our production, whether it's in California, Maine, Texas, Minnesota, or you name it. That when you put your production together, whichever state you're from here, it's put with other NFO members and farmers. And I, for one, am not going to apologize for holding actions or for the use of them in any way. And the next time that I want hear somebody say, I don't like the NFO because of the holding action, I'm going to say to them, then you are not as smart as the large companies in this country that announce their prices that also have a holding action when they do it. You're not as smart as the working people on the factory line that strike if they want to to get their wage, wages that they feel are fair and just. Only the American farmers are hesitant to stand up and be counted, and it's time we change that. <laughs> and I will say this among other things that if there were any other organization in America that had 100% of the production, not just 30, I sincerely believe that they would lack the courage to lead the fight of the economic battle necessary, and they'd take the whole 100% to the marketplace and say, what will you give me? And I'm not worried or concerned about criticism when we know we're right and we're just. But I am concerned about the fact that we haven't had the pride to go out and state our position and challenge anybody else to offer a plan or have the courage to lead the American farmers into a fight for justice, fairness, and respect. And it's time we got that pride that we deserve and that we've earned and that we stand behind each other and we use our influence to call on every American farmer to go to battle with us for fairness, justice, and respect. <laughs> Tomorrow afternoon, beginning in the morning, every department is going to say how the plans of backing up what you've decided this week and finish tonight, how to specifically do what's necessary. You know, I was in a meeting not long ago where a forum was being held, and I think, I'm not sure, that they were concerned discussing world food problems. And the panel apparently had done a good job of talking about world food problems and world needs. And I got in there just when some young lady 
got up and stumped the panel. And you know what she did? She asked a little simple question. What does an interested person do? It wasn't so simple, was it? Not a one of them could say the first thing that she could do. And that's the reason that we have our commodity Minuteman system and the variations of it. So we want you to leave this convention commodity by commodity, understanding what you're supposed to do come Monday morning. So there can be no doubt, because I think you either take the action and you use your determination and your influence to hit every corner and every nook of this country like bumblebees in every county or hornets if you want to that don't give up. To be able to unite, not for me, not for the NFO, but if you don't do it for yourself, what other chance is there to get a price based on the cost of production plus a reasonable profit? That is a decision you have to make. And I want you to think tonight and tomorrow as the convention continues and finishes as we try to outline to you your specific duties, your specific steps. And if there are those that you say, well, I've talked to the people in my home county too much. They won't listen to me. Well, there's an old saying, and an expert is somebody a long ways from home. So we'll ask you to go a few days about 100 miles from home with other people just like you. You know what the story is, and you can have that influence. There's going to be a place and a way for everybody in this auditorium, man, woman, lady, everybody. And I want us to turn this force of people loose throughout this country because we represent all corners of it, to take the leadership in American agriculture that should have been done 30 or 40 years ago. Many of you have fought and worked, and you want to finish it while you've still got vigor left. A young man that I'm sure this afternoon in the grain meeting spoke what a lot of young farmers are saying here in this meeting. He asked the question of the people here. If I go home and work, can I be sure you're doing it too? And that's the question. But I want us in 90 days' time to turn this country upside down for fairness, justice, and respect. You've got your goals. Think tonight. Congratulations on a historic step. But let's make this a reality and do it with determination, fairness, and courage that the American farmer should have had a long time ago. Let's do it. <laughs> Somebody just remind me, I'm not going to make another speech because I got plenty more to say. I hope to be able to say it tomorrow.
But you know, 10 years ago, we met in Milwaukee. And I'm going to tell you a little something tonight publicly that is funny and it's, it's, it's over now and enough gone. And that was that everybody said, or almost everybody said, except NFO people, that we'd never have the courage to have a milk holding action. And I'll tell you one that, a little secret. We were getting ready for the holding action and I had had information that the Department of Agriculture officials and all were saying NFO will never call a milk holding action. And I remember this particular time. It was to start at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, wasn't it? You know how I remember that so well? At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I got a phone call from Secretary of Agriculture Orville Freeman. Secretary came in and said, Orville Freeman's on the phone. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Word must have gotten out. It's been out for four or five hours, and the government must be going to try to take steps before we have the action. And I thought, well, uh, I'm not going to talk to him until after 4 o'clock. Next thought was too late anyway. Everybody already knows it out in the country. I just well find out what he wants to know. Came on, and he said, uh, hi, Orly. I said, hi, Mr. Secretary. How are you? He said, fine, how are you, Orly? I said, great. I wasn't going to say any more about only about the weather. <laughs> His next was, he said, uh, we're having a meeting down uh, uh, next week in the department to discuss a dairy. I said, uh, well, uh, uh, what's it all about, uh, Mr. Secretary? Well, we said we're going to discuss the uh, new uses of dairy products and advertising. And we're going to discuss new methods of selling milk products. But he said, I want you to understand before you come, there'll be no discussion of price. I said, well, Mr. Secretary, I know I can take you in my confidence. But I said, I won't be able to come. He said, well, why not? I'd like to have you. I said, well, you'll know in a very short time. And that is one hour from now, a milk holding action starts. And there was utter silence on the other end of the phone. <laughs> and he said, uh, after he started, he said, uh, how big an area? I said, nationwide. He said, he said, what do you think will happen? I said, I don't know. He said, this is verbatim. I can remember it well. He said, I've never told this. I thought I'd tell it tonight because Orville Freeman couldn't deny it, but he and I were the only ones on. I'm sure he wouldn't. I said, all I can assure you is we are going to fight with all the energy and strength we have. The dairy farmers' prices in a lot of places manufactured milk is $3 or below. Dairy farmers are going to be forced off the farm, and we're going to give them a chance to fight. And I said, I can assure you we do not intend to violate any laws. If there's any sign of that at any time, you feel free to call me but we're going to fight with all the strength we have to stop the liquidation of dairy farmers in this country. And he said, well, I can see why you won't be at the meeting. Good luck. <laughs> Only a few people know that. They knew it in the office. Is verbatim. And you know, the next story was, as we got pretty close to the contracts, and of course, government action taken, the 
I have to tell you more now. I'll start telling you, I guess. But I got a call from Herschel Newsom one morning. And he said, uh, I have, am speaking for people in government. And unless you call off the milk holding action, and this was at about 9 o'clock Washington time, uh, government is going to take action. And he said, I've got to let them know in 15 minutes. I said, Herschel, I want to talk to a few people, but I think I know the answer already. 15 minutes is not very long, but I think I know the answer. I called him back in a few minutes, and he was the master of the Grange. I called him back, and I said, you can tell whoever you're speaking for that we hope the government doesn't take action, but the threat of government action doesn't slow down our desire to give the American dairy farmer an opportunity to fight. And you can tell them that we're going to continue the action. <clears throat> All I'm saying this to you for is that another step to it, and that is, if you'll go back and check the records, we were also told that there wouldn't be any milk hearings. Do you remember that? And do you remember the nationwide milk hearings that raised the price of milk 40 cents a hundred? How many of you remember that after that? And then you remember we rattled the sword or saber just, oh, I shouldn't say that, you know. Be misinterpreted. I might be misquoted. But we started talking about enough, another milk action. And you know what? They had another hearing and we got another 40 cents. You remember that? A few months later? There's a lot of these things we couldn't tell you. And I was told that the department said they just couldn't raise the price while the holding action is on, but they were determined that they'd better raise it. People told me from within the department as soon as one way or another something happened, they would have a nationwide hearing. That was the same Secretary of Agriculture not many days before said we wouldn't even discuss price in that dairy meeting in Washington. I tell you this for a couple of reasons, to give the historic significance of this, our courage and our willingness to do what nobody predicts that we will do, because we're willing to fight for fairness and justice, but also to let everybody in this country know that we have just as much courage as we ever had and I believe more determination than we ever had because we are close to our goals and we're not going to turn back now with the help of everybody that has joined us and everybody that's been a part of it. And I hope that reminder that we have done a lot of things and we have turned a lot of things around in this country, just one example, just one example that it gives you the pride to go back home and be proud to be an NFO member and to be a proud to put the production together so we can get the cost of production plus a reasonable profit, and that's my last speech tonight. The Specialties Department this last year has made some of the greatest increases it has, it has ever made. It has again doubled its volume in the various commodities of hay, sunflowers, dry edible beans, and all the others that we uh, represent, millet included. At our meetings this convention, both on Tuesday and Thursday, we've had the best meetings that we have ever had at any convention, better turnout, better enthusiasm, and a determination in leaving those meetings that they were going to do something. 
In Hay, for example, the people are convinced that we can expand Hay into states that we're not in now. And if you know anything about Hay, you're aware that there is virtually no state in the union that doesn't raise it, doesn't have it for sale. The members left with the understanding and knowing how that they can develop the Hay program on a national basis in other states and have left with the determination to do that. In dry edible beans is an example. In our meeting, the members got together and decided to put blocks together and already have them initiated that we'll take and bargain with, with no strings attached, to break it out of the doldrums. Beans, if you're not a bean producer, are absolutely horrible. The price on them, they're down to levels that are below depression levels. And the membership says, we'll give you the beans. Let's go to work. Not only in the states that we're in right now, but in other areas. Absolutely positive attitude. Then probably one of the highlights of our meetings and this convention was the Sunflower meeting, where the members have made up their mind that they're going to have a continuous program in Sunflowers. And let me explain that for just a moment. In sunflowers in the past, the trade and the business world were only interested in the production starting about in July for that September when it came off. Last year, for the first time, we were able to contract in March. In other words, about four months in advance of any time previous so that we started contracting before sunflowers were ever planted. This year already, for 1977 crop, We've already started contracting. It's a record, it's a history mark event because it's never been done before. In addition to that, the members came here to this convention with already blocked half as much production as it took us all last year to put together. Already today, we have half as much as we had all last year. They realized that right here at the convention there was enough production that they could increase that to 75% of what we had last year right here by this afternoon. They also decided that when they got back to their respective counties in the sunflower growing areas that they're going to go out Monday morning and sign up for 1977 production, additional flowers to increase our block over last year and that they were going to sign up those flowers that are still available this year that have not been sold through the organization. And by doing that, we'll be in the market continuously from month to month for the whole year, another first. It was this type of determination that marked the whole of all of our meetings and specialties and gave the people the enthusiasm and courage to continue as they are. And I say that they deserve a great hand to have that kind of an opinion and determination to see that these programs go clear to the top, 30% cost of production to save our farms. Thank you. I present to you the Honorable Fred Richmond of New York. Thank you, President Orrin Lee Staley, Devon Woodland. You know, folks, in Washington, we're plagued by all sorts of organizations. And as the only urban member of the House Agriculture Committee, I'm obviously the target for every lobbyist of every farm organization in the country. But if there's one organization I love working with, I believe in it. It's the best of all the organizations. It's the National Farm Organization. And I really mean it. I've worked with all four organizations. And you folks are the young organization. You're sensitive. And I think you're all willing to understand that we're one country, one world, that we have to live together, and that we're going to work together. In Gulliver's Travels, the king gave it for his opinion 
that whoever could make two ears of corn or two blades of grass to grow upon a spot of ground where only one grew before. Microphone number nine. Any place else you can't hear? It isn't very plain back here at all. Microphone number nine area. Any People out over there in microphone nine. <laughs> anyway, in Gulliver's Travels, as I said, they gave it for the opinion that whoever could make two ears of corn, two blades of grass, to grow a, pot, a, a spot of ground where only one grew before would deserve better of mankind and do more essential service to his country than the whole race of politicians put together. <laughs> Well, as one of that race of politicians, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And even beyond that, as the only urban member of the House Agriculture Committee, totaling a, re representing a totally urban district, I applaud you, the men, men and women who do make two ears of corn and two blades of grass grow where only one grew before. But in the realities we face in our bicentennial year, there's no question that the cultivation of our nation's most, national, most valuable national and natural resource, our billion-plus acres of crop, pasture, and orchard land, depends upon the work of politicians as well as the never-ending work of farmers, ranchers, and the whole range of dedicated people in the agricultural industry. 1977 will be a watershed year for all of us, for you as food producers and for me as a food-oriented politician. In our recent history, only 1933, 1949, and 1962 have been similarly critical years. This year, those of us concerned with agricultural policy will deal with the omnibus farm bill, food stamps, public law 480, which is the Food for Peace program, and the pesticide bill. Individually, each bill will directly affect you, but in equally important ways, each piece of legislation will directly affect every American, including my own constituents in my nine-square-mile district, the 14th Congressional District of Brooklyn. You know, my nine-square-mile district is one of the smallest districts in the United States geographically. I have 550,000 constituents. It's been called by the almanac of American politics, the most multi-ethnic district in the United States. I have representatives of every country belonging to the United Nations live in my district. Forty-eight percent of my people are black, twenty percent are Hispanic. The rest belong to every ethnic group in the country. And it's only nine square miles. And I spent the last two years traveling around meeting you folks, traveling with your co Congress members like Rick Nolan, Tom Harkin, Berkeley Bedell, Martha Keyes, Floyd Fithian. And their districts go from 20,000 square miles on up. So I suppose I'm at the op opposite end of the, of the uh, sphere. There are, however, other forces at work in our society that will directly affect wheat producers, cattlemen, poultrymen, dairymen, and row crop producers, as well as urban workers and their families. In fact, even taking into account the terrible economic and environmental pressures of 1933, I believe that 1977 is going to be the most important year in terms of food-oriented legislation in our nation's history. 
There's no doubt on my mind that food production and distribution will be the overriding economic, political, social, environmental, and moral issue of the next decade. How well every nation in the global community fares, how well we get along with each other in this nuclear age, how well we are able to solve our energy problems, all these basic issues are dependent upon a sufficient supply of food produced and delivered to people when and where they need it. Now specifically, and of immense interest to all of us, are the provisions of the Omnibus Farm Bill that Congress must begin working on next month. The target prices for wheat, feed grains, rice, dairy products, and cotton must all be raised to reflect the drastically increased costs of production faced by farmers. We must reform the peanut program, possibly turning it into a target and loan program. Of special interest to me and to my constituents, living in the third poorest district in the state of New York, is reform of the food stamp program. This program, with all its well-publicized faults, is both essential for our nation's poor and with its billion-dollar market for your products, extremely beneficial for the farm economy. We must examine the priorities and programs of the recipients of our PL 480 program. That's the Food for Peace. To ensure that our food is being properly distributed to those we need it without the suffocating bureaucratic nightmares of inefficiencies, kickbacks, payoffs that mark too many of these necessary programs. I was absolutely horrified a year ago when I had breakfast with Secretary Butts, and he mentioned to me that Henry Kissinger was on his way to, Af to Egypt with $200 million worth of wheat in his back pocket to help him along with his political negotiations. I don't think we Mar Americans grew that wheat and donated it to starving people to help maintain dictatorships around the world, did we? <laughs> Furthermore, crop insurance programs are woefully small. They must be expanded nationwide, and adjustments must be made to the USDA disaster relief programs to take into account the new economics facing farmers. We will also have to come to grips with such controversial measures as grain reserves, price supports or quotas, particularly for sugar production, and financing assistance for young farmers. I think we all recognize that unless we pass some special legislation, there's no way we can ever get our young people of America enough capital to start farming. Also, we must expand and redirect agricultural research efforts and debate the extension of the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, commonly called FIFRA. In addition, I'd like to see an expanded USDA nutrition education program and in a move that I strongly believe will help bring together those of you who produce our food and consumers I believe we need consumer representation on USDA advisory boards. Overall, I promise that I will fight in the Agriculture Committee and on the floor of the House for a bill that represents my strongly held philosophy and my conviction that the best consumer policy this country can have is a positive, fair, and progressive farm policy. I'll fight for reasonable supports, decent levels of insurance, and guarantees that will once and for all enable the American farmer 
to receive their just share of an enormous gross national product in the United States. And only by allocating a just fare to the American farmer can we preserve the family farmer and stop this horrible erosion throughout the United States where each state each year shows a loss of family farmers. We Americans have to understand that the foundation of farming is our family farmers and hopefully this 1977 bill will once and for all strengthen each and every family so they can maintain their farms in decency, dignity, and with a reasonable amount of profit. The day has passed when such farm bills can be considered only as narrow, special interest legislation. Just as the day has passed when aid to New York City can be considered a strictly urban matter. Our nation is so interrelated that each segment of our economy is directly affected by both positive and adverse changes in another. The farm legislation we'll be drafting early next year, in reality, and in the finest sense of the word, will be American legislation. It's vital to our entire nation. Unique problems, a unique strength, a coalition which understands that neither of us can survive alone. We can only survive together. You know, friends, in my city of New York, we have 8 million people. My 8 million people, in order to survive, need 40 million acres of your land. That's farmland, pasture land, and grazing land. 40 million acres. I call them ghost acreage. Each, one, each American requires five acres of land. Now, 40 million acres is more farmland than you have in the entire northeast section of the United States. And that's what we alone need in order to keep New York City fed. That's how important you are. Now I'd like to spend a few moments exploring a series of related problems that many of you in rural America have not been forced to come to grips with yet. Almost a year ago, I located a previously classified CIA document outlining the potential political implications of climate that today most experts agree is in a period of change. Virtually all these climatologists agree that probable change will lead to cooler and in many parts of our country, drier growing seasons. You far better than I, know what that would mean. Coincidentally, one year ago, the National Academy of Science published the results of a three-year study in five carefully documented volumes that indicated that virtually what every one of you knows, the insect population is at best only being kept at bay, and in many cases is actually expanding damage by genetically becoming immune to our pesticide defenses. Energy costs at every level of farm production are soaring, and there is a real concern today about the necessary supply of natural gas for nitrogen and fertilizer produced by the early 1980s. In addition, the cost of mining our phosphate are skyrocketing far in excess of the national rate of inflation. And as you know, supplies of potash are constantly in a state of flux. To further complicate our problems, farmland costs for either purchase or rental are being forced upward by increased non-agricultural pressures. Also, the tax load farmers must bear is rising out of all proportion to the amount of produce that can be grown on that land. Water supplies are being depleted. As our irrigation wells are sunk deeper and deeper, and the current drought has reduced many of our reservoirs to dangerously low levels in some parts of the nation. Finally, labor negotiations are escalating. 
all through the country, and as we know, the stability of world markets, particularly on food commodities, is always a day-to-day -day matter. In short, every area of concern for the already over-concerned farmer indicates potential problems in the very near future. These problems are all serious. You and I both know that any one of them can wreak havoc with your annual plans. Even a short spell of drought and cold weather damaged over $1 billion of vegetable crops in California this past year. And I don't have to tell those of you from the Dakotas and Minnesota what the drought did to your area. I was horrified. I was out in Rick Nolan's district in Minnesota and noted that for the three years straight, not a single farmer there was able to produce a decent crop. Now let's try a small experiment, though. Suppose I wave my magic wand. You know, magic wands are very popular in Washington. And suppose just for a minute that all these problems went away. Let's hope the climate won't change, energy prices will stay at today's levels, new freshwater su supplies are discovered, and all those conflicts over land use will disappear. Now another wave of the wand. Your pest control works perfectly. Nobody wants to build a free freeway through your farm. Nobody's trying to develop it into something else, like a housing project or a coal mine. Time Magazine selects the American farmer as the man of the year. And the nation says, keep it up, you're doing great. And then to top it all, Washington gives you a tax cut, along with a 1977 bill you need and you deserve. That sounds beautiful, doesn't it? Could we ask for anything more? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, we could. Here's what I as a member of that race of politicians, I have to put, in the, put my wand down because there is something that could defeat us all, even if that dream world I just painted were to become true. There's a greater problem we must deal with, and it's all around us. It's universal, but we rarely talk about it. We've never had to deal with it before, not in all of man's history. Not now like we do right now. The most ominous problem facing mankind today is the quiet, inexorable growth in human numbers throughout the world. This growth often outpaces food production. It outpaces our ability to build schools, hospitals, and homes. It increases the size of our government. It makes overall energy conservation futile. It devours national parks, wilderness area, and farmland. It breeds urban shanty towns, and those shanty towns in turn breed poverty, disease, ignorance, hopelessness, and terror. This growth threatens to destroy our very life support system, the natural environment. How did the situation happen? How did it get so bad without our ever really perceiving it? What is the real population situation now, and what can we do about it? Well, those questions are the most important three questions the American farmer or the American consumer can ask today. There is a persistent idea that has hampered all nations from time to time that the enemy is always some outside danger, some lurking powerful threat, always endowed with the best arsenal that our imagination can give them. Well, my friends, in our time, the real enemy, your real enemy in the farm community, and my enemy in Brooklyn is population growth. If we were to climb an observation tower, we wouldn't need a very powerful telescope to see this enemy in action. This growth can be observed very close to home. Mexico is one of our largest neighbors. In 1900, her population was 13 million. Between 1900 and 1920, it grew by 1.5 million. 
between 21 and 40, he grew by 5.4 million. In the 50s, 9 million people were added. And between 1960 and 1976, 25 million people were added to Mexico's population. In a short 20 years, Mexico's population will double to over 120 million people. And conceivably, within the lifetime of your children, Mexico's population could exceed that of China today. I must emphasize that Mexico is but an example of how tragic population growth has become. What I've described in Mexico has been repeated in countries around the world. World population is on a roller coaster that is just beginning the first steep hill. While it took almost all of recorded history for the Earth's population to number one billion people, that was up to the year 1830, only 100 years passed until another billion people were added to the Earth's census. Then sometime in 1960, the world's third billion passenger climbed aboard. Sometime in 1974, a fourth billion passenger got on the Earth ship. And in a very short time, in approximately 12 years, another billion people will buy tickets for a ride on spaceship Earth. In other words, in 1830, the world's population was one billion. In 1930, it had doubled. In 1960, it went up another billion. In 74, it added one more billion. And by 1986, we'll be up to five billion people. Now, what does this growth in human numbers mean for the future of mankind? Well, I believe, unless it's checked, the world will experience famines and starvation on a scale never before seen in history. Slightly over 13 years from now, even if all goes well with our climate, our agricultural input, and everything else, the world will still run out of food. Over 100 million people will face starvation, and the next year, another 100 million. Now, as ominously hinted by our Central Intelligence Agency, how long do you think these hundreds of millions of people are going to sit still and not attempt to take food from some other country? It doesn't take a very fertile imagination to project what happens when a country or a group of terrorists sees other nations or people, such as the United States, with ample supplies of food while they face starvation. One has only to think a few moments to fully comprehend the lethal consequences of continued population growth. Hungry nations are not going to be friendly or peaceful nations. Terrorists will be all too willing to make us an offer we can't refuse. But we must not only look at those less developed nations, America is sitting on one of the most serious population problems in the world. That's right. Our own surveys have shown that most Americans don't think we have a population problem. Well, nothing could be more wrong. Every year, another 3.4 million Americans are added to this nation of ours. More each year than the populations of some 60 nations. If this current growth rate continues, the U.S. population will double in about 50 years. In the year 2026, and as you know, many of our children will be still around in 2026, 444 million Americans will be living here. Just think, with only half that many people today, population in America is causing us to bulldoze and pave over two million acres of farmland each year. We have to strip mine 100,000 acres of farmland. We've eliminated valuable conservation programs and shelter belts from our farmland. We've depleted the natural fertility of our soil. We suffered massive government regulation, mounting paperwork, export embargoes, 
We've destroyed wildlife. We've destroyed wilderness. 30, 40, 50 years from today, how many more square miles of countryside? How many more American farms will be covered with asphalt, shopping centers, clover leaves, urban sprawl, high-rise buildings? And even assuming yields continue to go up and there are no natural setbacks, sometime before the year 2000, again, under the best of circumstances, the United States will be forced to stop exporting food. By then, each year, another 8, 9, 10 million Americans will be fed from our dinner plate. Then we will not be tightening our belts to feed people in Africa or Latin America or Europe, but we'll have a problem feeding ourselves. We will have become the problem. And it's a very sobering thought, my friends. After the, rec after the recent election of the first farmer to the presidency of the United States since Thomas Jefferson, I was reminded of President Jefferson's remark that I'd rather dream the dreams of tomorrow than read the histories of yesterday. The histories of yesterday of our proud nation have been bold, innovative, daring, and vigorous. Our nation, and in particular, our nation's farmers, have responded to every challenge thrown at them. When the forces of totalitarianism threatened the freedoms of the world, we sent men to fight and maintain them over supply lines that logistically boggled the imagination. When nations faced starvation, this nation and her farmers rallied and sent food in staggering amounts in the finest humanitarian tradition of this land. If, however, I'm right about the ter terrible pressures of population, the Jeffersonian dreams of tomorrow will become nightmares. Faced with a seemingly overwhelming problem, what can we do? You, the farmers, and us, that race of politicians. What can we do? Well, first of all, we can bring about a halt to continued U.S. population growth by bringing our birth rate down even further, by balancing immigration and immigration, and by once and for all halting illegal immigration. In New York City alone, we estimate with all our unemployment, all our troubles, we have over one million illegal aliens. The United States can declare a policy of reaching population stabilization at some future date. Canada, for example, will soon be declaring a national goal of population stabilization only a few years from now. All Americans can demand that no U.S. foreign assistance go to nations unconcerned about population growth. U.S. citizens can instead request that their government double, perhaps even triple, the amount of foreign assistance to any nation which actively seeks to lower its birth rate or is doing so now. I know that you are extremely concerned, as am I, about the upcoming farm legislation. But I must take this opportunity to urge all of you to help those of us in Congress seek answers for this ultimate problem. In the final analysis, as President-elect Carter stressed all through his historic campaign, government initiative can and ultimately must come from the people of this country. While America alone cannot solve the problems of the world, America can begin to tackle her own and in the process show the leadership and vision which others hopefully will follow. The officers, staff, and members of the National Farm Organization have shown such leadership and vision in major rural economic and social efforts. I'm confident that your voice will be heard and listened to in Washington during these next critical legislative months. And by the way, folks, you have one of the best lobbyists in Washington, my old friend Chuck Fraser. I'm hopeful that the Carter-Mondale administration will offer all Americans a Secretary of Agriculture 
who will be a champion for the interests of the family farmer, as well as a man or woman who will heed the cries of the urban and suburban consumer as they express their interest in the development of a truly national food policy. And I might as well tell you that many of us in Congress are doing everything we can do to get the President-elect to nominate Bob Berglund as our next, next Secretary of Agriculture. My friends, the days of Earl Butts have passed. Jefferson's dreams Jefferson's dreams of tomorrow are ahead of us. We, race of politicians, will soon tackle the immediate problems, and with your help and God's grace, we will also seek answers to the ultimate population problem before it simply overwhelms us. Thank you very much. And most of all, thank you folks for the privilege of being the representative of the single most largest land block in the United States. This brings two things for me. It brings attention, and it also brings the thing that Orrin Lee talked about the other night, respect. Respect comes because we had the numbers put together and the pe we were strong enough to be able to go in and to bargain effectively for this organization and its membership. My job basically is intelligence gathering, getting information together, bringing it to the membership, the growers, coming up with proposals, and acting in general as a consultant to the grower. Then we begin to influence the market in order to get ourselves in a bargaining position in order to obtain a reasonable price. I represent mostly the small growers. Keep this in mind. I represent mostly the small growers who were the first to recognize the fact that they are not in a good bargaining position. Now, they didn't have all the wonderful uh, information that's available in the colleges today, but they did see that the big grower, the fellow with more lambs, attracted the l better buyers, and they were able to tell the difference between 35 and 40 cents. So they decided to do something about it. They recognized that it was important to organize and to unify within their areas. To give you some examples, in Mendocino, way out on the coast of California, very small farm flocks. We put a block together of approximately 20,000 lambs. We sold them anywhere from six to eight dollars over the best lambs in California. These weren't the best lambs, and, I, and they know it as well as I do. We then went on over to Alamosa, Colorado, Monta Vista, again, small ranchers with small farm flocks. But I'm going to come back to this because this is quite a phenomena. We went over there, we sat down, we worked out our prices, we placed a price on them, and we sold them. We then went on over to Montrose, Colorado. We turned around, we did the same thing, we inventoried, and we got our numbers together, we put a price on them, and we sold them, and so on into Utah. But to give you some of the side effects, the Monta Vista block, which only amounted to about 12,000 lambs, was instrumental in selling 50,000 other lambs outside of our block. The buyer, while we were sitting on a log in Colorado, told me, he said, you know, Dick, you really spooked me. And spook me is another word for influence. 
He said, you know, I bid, I thought, real well over there at Monta Vista. In fact, I, put, I felt I gave all I could and then put on $2 because I wanted to buy those lambs, and I still lost them. So then you went over to Mont Rose, and you turned around, and you sold that block of lambs. So I decided to, that I could possibly save 50 cents a hundred, and I could buy the lambs north of you uh, that were not members at 50 cents. And he bought 50,000 lambs. He said, do you know that that situation is going to cost me at least a quarter of a million dollars or more? We did it with 12,000 lambs, folks, 12,000 lambs. Now, if you don't think that a few people can make a difference, those of you that have come by air, just take a look at that rigmarole that we go through to get on an airplane. And I dare say that in the United States, it's probably the only place that private citizens are personally searched without some criminal uh, situation involved. I doubt if there's over 50 hijackers in the United States that have been that perpetrated this crime and yet 50 people have caused what all of us have to go through time and time again and even have our civil rights violated in order to get on an airplane so a few people can make a difference now when we were over in Colorado we uh, sold our lambs probably anywhere from I'd say seven to ten dollars over the market when they came due. And I went over to a, a gentleman that had a large number of sheep and asked him if he wouldn't uh, go with us on this block and sign up his production. And he was kind enough to remind me that he said, uh, I really don't need NFO. This town was started by my grandfather. It's named after my grandfather. It's my family's been here for three generations, and I've got more buyers than I know what to do with. So I really don't see where you could be much service to me. His pride didn't get in the way when he called me to see if I could get 38 cents when I'd offered 50 and a half on the contract. That didn't get in the way then. Now you ask, how? How did we do this? First of all, a reliable inventory. Not a banker's count, a reliable working inventory. This is important. And the, the, the important part of the whole thing is the fact that we've got the inventory and not the buyer. Those of you that have the buyers who once a year call you up and say, how are you, how's the family, and how's the weather, and then we get down to what they called you for, how's your sheep? How's the range conditions? Are you going to have more fats? Are you going to have more feeders? Did you, did you twin more? Uh, what's the whole story over there? And by the time that he has done, got done with that telephone call, call, he knows more about your business than you do. And then he makes the several other calls to your neighbors, and then pretty soon that whole area is totally in his pocket as far as information is concerned. That's, this is where the information belongs. This is where the inventory belongs with your representative and not somebody else's. The second thing is, is a contract for sale. This may not look like a hammer, but it is. This is the hammer that drives the spike in. I can do an awful lot of talking about lambs and the numbers we have, but without a solid contract to say these lambs are off the open market, you're not going to get your hands on them until you deal with me. Make up your mind to it. When he makes up his mind to it, he finds out that these lambs are off the market, we've got a whole change of attitude. The day we sold the lambs at Montrose, Colorado, I had called a buyer the previous night. His price was 45 cents. By the time that he called me back the next morning and I told him that we sold this block of lambs at 50 and a half, he then asked me if I could put another block of lambs together for 51 cents. 
Man, that market jumped that night, didn't it? Now, what's the missing link? Why hasn't this come together? It belongs in your lap, folks. You are a total mystery to me. I can't believe that the person that will take a kernel of grain, put it in the ground, hope it'll rain, hope it'll grow, hope you can harvest it, and hope you can get a price for it. I can't believe it's the same people that will breed a cow for a calf, hope it comes up alive, run it for several months, and hope you can sell it. I can't believe it's the same pig man that will breed a sow, get some pigs, raise it, do all the work, and hope he can get a price. And the same thing with the ewe flock man. I can't believe that you can go one chance, two chance, three chance, four chances, and yet you can take all those chances, but in the last final commitment, you cannot make up your mind. That's where the clincher is, folks, that last final commitment. And you're going to have to make up your mind to it because that's the way it's going to have to be. Now, we didn't have all love and roses over there in Colorado. We sold a block of lambs that normally in the old days would be termed as we had one whale of a wreck. We had a buyer that was willing to take the lambs. He'd signed a firm contract, but his banker, due to the fact that the market dropped, decided not to finance him. So there we were, right in the middle of delivery and one whale of a wreck. Well, it wasn't a whale of a wreck. It just proved one more NFO program. It just proved that we've learned something from the mistakes we've made in the past. I made a call to Gene Potter. I told him the problem. He flew out in an airplane with NFO lawyers. We flew down and talked to this banker. He got the first-hand information, came back, and the reserve account took over after we resold the lambs. And outside of a little delay in checks due to the legalities of releasing the lambs, not one NFO grower took less than what we signed that contract for. Now, that's a big one, folks. That's a big one. <laughs> Warren Lee spoke the other night about what our forefathers of agriculture would say about agriculture today. Well, I'd say one thing. I'd say this group would be exempt. In fact, I'd think they'd walk up and salute you for the battles that you've fought and the positions that you've taken and the things you've done. In fact, here at this convention, it ought to be a day for the veterans of NFO because that's what you people are, the veterans of the past fights that you've got to get us here. Just keep this in mind. Over 200 years ago, George Washington and the signers of the Declaration of Independence would never be the heroes that they are today if we didn't have a few good soldiers to stand and fight for what they believe in. Now, we're in a struggle. There's no doubt about it. But we're not in a struggle against the government. We want to help the government balance the, balance the budget and balance this deficit. And we want to do it by sound agriculture. We're not against industry. We want to bring industry up to full production so all workers can enjoy the benefits of the, of the American way of life. And we're not at war at the cons with the consumers. In fact, we want to serve the consumers. But we are at war with those people who support the system that produces cheap food at the American farmer's expense. That's who we're at war at. I've talked to my people in the sheep divisions. They're going to go out, they're going to hammer on the doors, and they're going to start getting contracts for sale so I can go to work. Now, as Phil Allen would say, something to think about. 
A hundred years ago, when I, I attended the Montana Convention and this brought it to my attention, a hundred years ago, Custer fought at the Battle of Bighorn. He made the disastrous mistake, as all military historians will agree, of dividing his forces. And it was the first time that the Indians had ever united, and they beat him. They beat him. The sad part of this was that the Indians never united again. Now, folks, just who do you think are wearing the feathers today? Thank you. Thank you, Devon, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Never before in the history of American agriculture has it become more evident than in the year of 1976 that the nation's livestock producers are being faced with the results of a lack of an organized effort in helping stabilize the price of their product. The NFO, through its nationwide effort to break the old patterns of continued economic loss and establish new concepts in collective bargaining, is steadily gaining support through its dedicated membership. These members, through their ever-increasing involvement in the feeder cattle program, are what makes the concept work. This is being accomplished in a twofold effort. Number one, the increased participation of NFO feeder cattle producers, and number two, the increased number of NFO feedlot operators who are becoming repeat buyers of NFO feeder cattle. In the year of 1976, the feeder department has made an all-out effort to establish consistent grading and weighing conditions which are allowing us to compete in the competitive market level. The grading of livestock is the key and the answer to attaining top prices and fairness to all the members involved and also maintaining continued repeat buyers. The NFO's reputation of furnishing fresh cattle on a graded basis is becoming our strongest selling point. To compete in the competitive market level, we must use the positive approach and think as a group. The individual ideas and concerns must be respected, but to become effective, the organized group has the strongest voice in raising the market level. This calls for the support of your local feeder representatives, as they are working in the members' behalf they are not the opposition and someone to be criticized, but the man to work with, showing confidence and cooperation. The last three months of this year have shown a 20% increase over last year. It was at this same time that the feeder blocker program was initiated. This shows the effectiveness of this kind of action when the feeder blocker works with the national program. We need only look at the unstable markets of the year to realize what must be done in the year ahead. As livestock producers operating on an individual basis of the past 200 years, the day for a change has come. The objective has always been and always will be to achieve the cost of production plus a reasonable profit. The NFO is the only organization in America today with that objective for you, the producer, working in your behalf. So I'm going to ask you, ladies and gentlemen, on Monday morning to go out and ask your fellow members in your meat boards to join together with you, with 100% of your production and theirs, to achieve your rightful 
place in American agriculture with our cost of production plus a reasonable profit. And this can be done by signing cattle on your contract, forming large blocks, and giving us the ability to go out and do the bargaining. It gives me pleasure to once again congratulate the feeder cattle producers from the state of Missouri for not only being the leaders in the number one feeder cattle movement through the NFO, but this year of 1976, they have shown a vast increase over 1975. And also to the state of South Dakota, who now ranks second in the number of NFO feeder cattle moving through the program. It is most gratifying to see members join together with a common goal in mind and members wanting to make their organization effective. The necessity of blocking with livestock committed on contract is the only effective tool that the NFO feeder department has to work with. In areas where volume is increasing, this is being adhered to. This is a positive approach, which allows your feeder department description of weight, breeds, numbers, and gives us the ability to find the best market for your product. And in closing, to rephrase the famous words of President John Kennedy, ask not what your organization can do for you, but what you can do for your organization. But ever, but what, <clears throat> and it, keeping it ever in mind that we get the cost of production plus a reasonable profit and the 30% of production. So with a full member participation and God's help, we can not only know, be known as the backbone of the nation, but also as the lifeline of American agriculture, the National Farmers Organization. I thank you. Mm -hmm. well, you're getting so you can speak. Put you on a tour. At this